Thanks, Mage, and thanks everyone for coming. As you might have guessed, tonight we're going to be talking about sleep. So I'm hoping that all of you are like this little fella and get a wonderful, relaxing sleep every night. But I'm pretty sure that's not the case, unfortunately. <laughs> The first How to Have a Healthy Mind Dinner with Dharma that we presented nearly a year ago was on mental illness and common mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. So today I thought we'd look at one of the more fundamentals to building a healthy mind. And it's not very well understood, so let's try and unravel the secrets of sleep together. Sleep's um, been talked about a lot in the popular media. And I think that's because people don't really understand it completely. It's such an individual thing. And no one has that magic formula. Barack Obama apparently sleeps four hours a night. Wow. Wow. Ariana Huffington is promoting the sleep revolution. Everyone get eight hours. Travel agents um, promote sleep vacations. Go and get your sleep back on your holidays. <laughs> and big companies like Google have these sleep pods. <laughs> so in the afternoon, have a nap and that will help boost Google's productivity. All right, tonight we're gonna divide into two halves. So we're gonna look at the science of sleep because I love the science of it, and I think that's partly the way we understand and can improve things. So what it is, how much we need, why do we need it, what can go wrong from a medical point of view. And then the second part, we're gonna actually marry some Buddhist and Western principles and try and improve our sleep for all of us. Okay, some work for you guys. I love quizzes. So all in numbers. So I yell out the answers. So we'll go from the top. By the time he reaches the age of 80, an average human will have spent how many years of his life sleeping? 43. 23. 23. 23. 30. Whatever, 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. Yep. Like having a blood alcohol level of how much? 0.05 is it or 0.03? So 0.05 is yep, drinking limit, so you can't drive after... after 0.02? 0 0.1. 0.1? Chris! <laughs> 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 0.05 actually, you're correct. 0.05. What percentage of Australians experience poor or inadequate sleep every day? 80%. <coughs> this is every day, though. Every day, every day so not. Oh, every day. Oh. Doing very well. It is. 20 to 35 percent every day. Wow. Yeah. 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 You read this paper? <laughs> so, this was a study in 2013 which has these figures in it. The economic cost of sleep problems to Australia. Every year is how much? Eight hundred thousand. One million. 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 Wow. Oh. Are you serious? Yeah, and this includes sleep problems, uh, work days lost, and sleep related accidents. Doesn't include loss of quality of life, so feeling, feeling terrible doesn't make that cut, but everything else does. So, everyone did really well. Wow. Okay, boring stuff. Always have to start with the definition. So, sleep is temporary and reversible. It better be or we're in trouble. Um, it's definitely a state of altered <laughs> consciousness. And perceptual disengagement. So we're certainly not interacting with our environment. Now scientists uh, actually define it by specific changes in brainwave activity, which we're going to have a look at, because I, I like graphs. 
Um, and also specific changes in breathing, heart rate and temperature. <coughs> and it's really quite amazing how the body works. I mean, before I studied this, I would have thought that we are just kind of <coughs> flat and resting. But <coughs> these massive changes happen, so our breathing slows down, our heart rate slows down, temperature regulation actually changes quite a lot as well. So first graph, there's only a couple. This is the sleep cycle of a healthy young adult. So of all of you, <coughs> healthy young adults. And the line across is time. So when you go to sleep to when you wake up. Up and down shows shallow sleep to deep sleep. So a couple of things I want to point out with this is, you can see it's, there's a lot going on. One, we cycle through sleep every 90 minutes or so. Shallow to deep, shallow to deep. Oops. <laughs> the second thing is a lot of our deep sleep happens early on in the night. So just here, deep sleep. Which is really handy for humankind because if we get woken up at 3, 4 a.m., we actually have had quite a lot of our deep restorative sleep. The other really interesting thing is these black bars. They're really quite short <coughs> And that's when we all actually wake up a little bit. Now most of us don't remember, but as we cycle out of that deep sleep into that shallow sleep, we all wake up and have a brief kind of consciousness. And if we were to be disrupted, we'd probably be very aware of it the next morning. Well, a, a, a lot of us would probably go to the zoo at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so wait for the next time. <laughs> Mum's very aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> In the older adult, none of us here. <laughs> um, this is a healthy older adult. So it has changed. There is this is still classified as deep sleep, but certainly not quite as deep. Does that white infants need much more sleep compared to like elderly? Because you'll see elderly sleep for like like yeah, oh, yeah. five to six hours. Yeah. 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 The other interesting thing is yeah, the elderly wake up quite a bit more and actually for a little bit longer and tend to go for a loop, yeah. 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 The children children actually have uh, a bit more REM sleep as well and they're it's forming or developing their brains. But is it explain why not such a deep sleep? <laughs> why not? Huh? Why not? I don't think we then? really know, but we just know that it really changes through the life cycle. So sleep's quite a relatively new area of medicine, isn't it? Just so you, understanding the differences. It's like you actually when you use a sleeping mechanism where people can really go into a deep sleep state for the older people, is it means the lifespan of human being can extend, like <laughs> yeah, not sure. The repair, you know, the repair and the yeah. Up. Look, we think this is still normal, um, and there is deep sleep there, so this is still a healthy, healthy adult, um, and there are specific techniques for older people to sleep better um, in terms of some people find that napping actually helps them a bit more um, because as well as this cycle their whole body clock the whole body clock changes as you get older too I don't know if anyone's noticed as you're getting older that you tend to wake up earlier oh sorry wake up earlier in the morning and also feel sleepier earlier and that's yeah. I've taken out that slide actually but the body clock <laughs> <laughs> but the body clock changes as well you mentioned yeah. earlier that like uh, Obama sleeps only four hours, for example. There's like pr like plenty of prominent historic people who have like mm. advocated sleeping in cycles of like a four hours on and then having a half hour nap, yeah. um, and then sleeping for like twenty minutes to half an hour every four hours after that. So yeah. over a twenty four hour period, you'd still get mm. maybe six. Yeah. So it still seems less than the eight that's advocated today. Yeah. So there's but another slide as well. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> so we won't go into that. But certainly, you're right. So as I said at the beginning, it's a really individual experience. So um, this is typical, but already you can see through 
age is just one factor where it's different. Um, but but yeah, you're right. So I think there's rumours, but it's really hard to study and confirm these things. That Einstein's the ten out. So um, and Winston Churchill apparently napped all through Congress during the World Wars. Well, yeah, Tesla was apparently like mm. like known for sleeping only two hours a night. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was like throughout his whole like academic career. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, one of the greatest ones of all time. So it's like yeah. Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we're not all Tesla, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not. So I'm, I'm a I'm a sleeper and a napper. But so the older this point of this slide, the older person certainly has a few more awakenings, slightly longer. So they're more likely to notice, go to the loo, and sometimes tend to get a bit more frustrated, I suppose, and have trouble getting back. Mm. But perhaps just recognising that it's a normal process um, and not not getting frustrated too much. If you spend more than 15 minutes in bed rolling around, you're better off getting up, having a walk, come back to bed. Okay, why do we need it? It says on the slide. Okay, I'll just go through the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so the initial thoughts when we first started studying sleep was that when we were hunters and gatherers, food gatherers, there was no point in being awake at night because we couldn't hunt any food. So why not rest and conserve energy? But as we've seen, a lot goes on when we're sleeping and at various points we're <coughs> using more energy than when we're awake. So these two theories are gaining prominence. The repair and restore theory is a bit like a spring clean. So we're getting rid of toxins, rid of all the Cells that need repair, um, growth in kids is really important. And as well as the body, the mind needs to repair as well. So the brain plasticity theory um, says that we need to sleep to be able to consolidate our learning and, and ingrain our memories. Okay. So how much do we need? I think I think you read this. So eight in the book? Yeah, they like they in Western like countries or Western cultures, they advocate eight, but yeah, yeah you'll, you'll see historically and culturally through different places, yeah. that's not necessarily a stable number. It changes from place to place. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. Um, again, it varies through the age, and this is from the National Sleep Foundation, um, and it most of us are in this group, so seven to nine. It does make allowances though, so small percentage, we think up to 5% will lie outside. So some people will sleep six hours, I think Chris is a fairly short sleeper, and seem to be very refreshed and be able to function optimally with six. Others really need 10 or 11 to function optimally. And, yep. But is that in your genes? Is that something you can't alter? That? That's how people are programmed? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think anyone really knows, but mm -hmm. I think probably thought to be, yeah, something genetic. I certainly yeah. think um, my genes are, like, in families, it runs very similarly, yeah. Is, is there any relationship between how much sleep you need and metabolic rate? So um, we'll, so we'll go on. <laughs> the reason I'm yeah. asking is that um, intuitively, I would yes. have thought that if you had a higher metabolic rate, you would need to sleep less. But it seems from my observation mm. that this may not be at all true. Okay. Um, so we'll see a little bit later that there's a correlation between sleep and weight gain, actually, obesity. So it's probably quite a complex interplay. Yeah, but often those who have a little bit more on them than they should um, sleep less than those who don't suffer You'll find it's true on both sides of the spectrum. So lack of sleep and oversleeping can both contribute to both weight gain and weight loss. And I think like the other individual said, that can be both genetic but as well environmental. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to pinpoint like, mm -hmm. and it changes those, these figures are for average individuals as well. So um, like you know, from an average point of view, that may be the case for you if you live a lifestyle that you know, it's, it's heavy stressful or, you know, overly working, so you may need more than the average person. It factors in how you live as well. Yeah. So, great discussion, guys. Um, <laughs> we'll just keep moving on, though, for now. Um, 
So if there's, just stop me at any time, but I might need to race through a couple of these slides, I think. Um, so 5% we think will function okay. Certainly if you're getting more or less, the thinking is that physical and mental health will suffer. So it's a classic Buddhist middle way, in a way. Yeah. Um, people who are getting that 10 or 11 hours and still not feeling refreshed, I think we probably have to look at reasons why. And so just remember that point and we'll come back to it. So what can go wrong? So besides looking like this, <laughs> so without the nestling, we'll become tall to year old. Apparently. <laughs> And I think, I don't think we'll end up with the energy of Harvey, um, but certainly I think the point of the author is that there's been shown to be reduced learning, reduced coordination, reduced performance in general. But as most of you probably know, it sounds like, there's a lot more that goes on. So these are complications of insomnia, and not just insomnia. So the graphs on insomnia, but it's also inadequate sleep or um, poor quality sleep which we'll also talk about. So slowed reaction time and lower performance, we've talked about. But also, you can imagine if people aren't sleeping well or staying awake um, in the middle of the night, more likely to have mood disorders like depression or anxiety. By the same token, people who are depressed or anxious tend to present with symptoms of poor sleep. At a physical level, though, it can also cause things like high blood pressure, diabetes, it can affect metabolism, as we were saying earlier. So there is a risk, high risk of obesity. And we think that's related to upsetting of the body clock and the circadian rhythm. Heart disease, and again, if you're getting a lot of colds or getting a lot of flus, um, you might want to check your sleep because, as we said, sleep's important for repair and growth. So immune function is affected by lack of sleep. And it's not just individuals, right? So all of us are affected um, by other people's lack of sleep as well. So we're worried about our own health. But fatigue is probably one of the biggest causes of motor vehicle accidents, as we know. Shift workers, I think some of us here have done shift work. Um, and that's being studied quite a lot because worker fatigue has contributed to some of the biggest industrial accidents like Chernobyl or um, the Exxon oil disaster, Space Shuttle Challenger. So a lot of research goes into how to time those shifts um, and how best to manage sleep when you're a shift worker. Uh, this slide looks at some of the common sleep problems. And by far and away, the most common is just us not getting enough. But in terms of medical conditions, these two are the, well, they, they make up about half of the medical conditions in Australia. So insomnia, do, you, do some of you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just not being able to fall asleep. So if you're not falling asleep within 30 minutes, or waking up at night and not getting back to sleep within 30 minutes, that's considered insomnia. And I think all of us at some point will experience that. Chronic insomnia is insomnia lasting more than a month for a minute. Sleep apnea is really interesting. Um, often people can wake <coughs> up after 10 hours sleep and feel like they've had 10 hours in uninterrupted sleep, but a dead time. So they'll get to work and feel like they need to sleep, get in a car, um, feel like they need to nod off when they're driving, um, and or just have have having a meal, like lunch, and need to nap right away. And the reason for this, it's called obstructive sleep apnea. It's often picked up by partners, actually. And they tell their partner something. Anyone know what that is? Snoring. Snoring. You're snoring. <laughs> Get out of my room. <laughs> um, so very loud snorers. Are, uh, it's not diagnostic of sleep apnea. Because what happens when you snore is that your airways are literally it makes some noise when you're kind of breathing, particularly at night. When it completely obstructs, then 
your body's basically stopped breathing, there's no oxygen. And your brain's quite happy, resting, going through that cycle. And all of a sudden there's like, warning, 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 breathe. <laughs> so your body has to take a big breath. And if you can imagine the body doing that, or the brain doing that three or four times every hour, these people aren't going to get a good night's sleep. So obstructive sleep apnea yeah. is probably one of the more underdiagnosed conditions. And if you've certainly got that history of daytime sleepiness, it's just something to bear in mind. Circadian rhythm disorders, really interesting um, because they're disorders of the body clock. So it's when jet lag is probably something we've all experienced. We all have a really interesting system in our brains, which tells, which tells us to wake up when it's morning, tells us to sleep when it's dark, but also gives us quite alert at eight or nine o'clock and makes us sleepy at two to four. I know because I like my naps. In the elderly, as we said earlier, it gets shifted. So they'll tend to be a bit sleepy earlier. Anyone have teenagers at home? No. Yeah. Not now. Not now. Well, they're still in home. Delayed. <laughs> <laughs> so they tend to um, not be sleepy at the right time and be very difficult to get out of bed as well. Narcolepsy again, excessive daytime sleepiness. Restless legs, self-explanatory, and parasomnia, so sleepwalking, sleep terrors. Other medical problems which interfere with sleep, mental illness, as we spoke about. A lot of people drink alcohol to get a better sleep. And certainly you get to sleep earlier, but you don't quite get that deep restorative sleep. Mm -hmm. You tend to wake up a bit earlier as well. If you're in pain, if you've got burning, you've got asthma and you're coughing all night or running to the toilet all the time, mm -hmm you're not going to get a great sleep. And if you have children. The <laughs> 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 noise and noise. And if it's too noisy or too cold, obviously, that's going to affect sleep. So where's stress? Stress? Mm, we under that oh, side, I suppose. <laughs> but certainly stress is probably the biggest thing that, that causes a short-term interference in our Okay, so I, I think what to do, if you've got any of those problems or that excessive daytime sleepiness, I think go and see a doctor and talk about them. Um, because there's a lot of research and a lot of money going into sleep and managing it best. But for the rest of tonight, I think we're going to actually combine some Buddhist and Western principles together. Because we are at dinner with Dharma. And this is a great topic I found as I was doing my reading for actually combining the two principles. And these are some things that I would tell most people um, that don't need <coughs> specialists. First discipline. <coughs> first training is discipline. <laughs> so the first one's discipline. And the thing I love about Master Shing Yun is that he really talks about routine and gives very clear specifics. And it's just about having a very clear idea of what we're doing every single day. So plan in the morning, act during the day, reflect in the evening, and rest at night. And that's his advice. So don't sleep in in the morning, don't rest in the morning, and don't act during the night. And if we can follow that structure, we might be halfway there. From a Western point of view, one of the first things we talk about is sleep hygiene. And it's not having shower in bed or sleeping in the bath. It's very specific do's and don'ts. And the do's are having the right temperature and creating that right environment for sleep. So sound is usually no sound, getting the TV out of the room. Light is making sure you've got curtains so that the sun doesn't come in at 5 a.m. and hit your face. And then regular sleep hours. So sorry if I'm starting to sound like your mother's, <laughs> but my mum was right. Really regular sleep hours help, and in particular, wake up hour. So that body clock really relies on our morning wake up to kick in. In that same vein, bright light in the morning, so opening those curtains and getting bright light at seven or whenever you want to wake up, again tells that body clock that it's time to kick in. Exercise is good for most things. And I think mothers will know this as well, winding down 
preparing for sleep and having a routine. Yeah. So when is the exercise <coughs> suggested? Uh, so, the dose. <laughs> um, you're right. <laughs> so like most things, it's very much a middle way. So there's do's and don'ts. So exercise not more than, not less than three hours prior. So if you sleep at nine, try not to get out and about um, after six. Yeah. Because that certainly stimulates things. Yeah. If there's a, like no obligation <coughs> in the morning, is there a, an hour to wake up, which is deemed like the best hour to wake up? I think the Venables wake up at five or six today. Um, the dopes, I thought this is very similar to the precepts actually, so no intoxicants. So no caffeine, four to six hours prior. Smoking's actually a stimulant, so again, probably the same um, as exercise. Blue light, recent studies have shown that that mm -hmm. laptop yeah. at night. Mm -hmm. Mostly have a light. Where you can set your computer. <laughs> it's cheating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the light actually dimming down, <coughs> the colour change to more yellow lurid. It and then does. Your laptop. <laughs> so before you sleep, you kind of like in that three hour frame, you actually already change your, your brain and up. nerve. And so yeah, yeah. yeah. the bad half hour you want to so you could cheat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you could cheat, or, or you could turn off the laptop. <laughs> yeah, two hours before. Heavy food, pretty self-explanatory. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, second discipline, meditation. And I think meditation is a real buzzword, really, in Western psychology, um, society in general, and that's great. And studies have been done. And this is a fairly small study recently of twenty-five subjects who were given mindfulness exercises to do for 20 minutes or given sleep education. Um, and they met over six weeks and they found that the people who did the mindfulness exercises actually reported less depressive symptoms, less fatigue. And this was just 20 minutes. So if you can do that 20 minutes every day, that could just help things a little. Fairly simple exercises to do. Um, and there's a lot of apps out there. Oh, counting, oh my counting the breath as <laughs> you, um, as, as, as you, I mean, I, I just do this, I find I do it sort of automatically. Um, I mean, it's the same way as I do when I meditate in yep. the morning. And that uh, I count my breath and, um, and, and it's very and nice. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that, that in itself is a type of mindfulness <coughs> practice. So I think um, I've been shown an app, and this is actually the one I've been shown is the one um, I do use, I use quite a lot, because the voice on it is just so soothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the Michael Checking <laughs> app, <laughs> the yeah, Bloods for AGI, they, yeah, have they, have <laughs> they can download it, free. And it's certainly a great app because it features progressive muscle relaxation, as well as a mindful practice, and it's quite a short, short app as well, so five to ten minutes. But I think from a Buddhist point of view as well, I think I speak for DVP and NPI and, and the lovely Ben Mujue when I say that <laughs> that wasn't specifically designed for sleep. It was designed for Buddhist practice and transitioning from, say, waking up to going to work, having lunch, being able to use that mindfulness practice, not just 20 minutes a day, but throughout the day. Because as Buddhists, it's not just sleep we're focused on. So a very simple saying from a Chaya master was, when I eat, I eat. When I sleep, I sleep. But how many of us can actually do this? Yeah, a lot of multitasking. So the idea of the app is to help us refocus at each point. And Men Will Yin Shun in the Way to Buddhahood actually is a very detailed book and very specific um, talks about he actually talks about sleeping in or having wakeful yoga in specific periods which may interest you um, yeah, he has a specific routine for going to sleep and then when one is about to sleep one should cultivate the thought of brightness the skillful practice even when sleep and dreams will become bright so I think 
in a way where you're counting all the way up to sleep, you're being mindful. He's suggesting that with good practice, even in sleep, it can be a continuation of our daily mindfulness. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Last training. This is done. So this was really hard because of, um, I don't have much wisdom. <laughs> but I'm hoping. <laughs> <you're getting more. laughs> I'm hoping you can all help me in the group work uh, build on this. So wisdom, I think, is just looking at our thought processes and how to rework them for sleep. The Buddha was a physician. Apparently, he had 84,000 treatments for our different ailments. And he said that the three major causes of illness are greed, anger, and ignorance. <coughs> We're going to go with anger first because the effects of anger are the worst of the three poisons. Of the 98 worries, this is the most stubborn and of all the diseases of the mind, the most difficult to cure. And I agree with that. I think if I've had a horrible night's sleep, I'm just angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if anyone's just not been able to sleep at night and uh, tossing and turning uh, with their eyes open and the world's silent. I think everything's amplified at that point. Who are you? the most angry at you at that point? Or what? Yourself. Yourself, yeah. So do you want to do this? <laughs> yeah, <I'm back>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Arjun Brahm actually has a great podcast, um, which Janice, one of the Prajna uh, ladies sent to me. And I just want to share his story for dealing with this problem. He talks about when you're lying in bed at night, carrying the worries of yesterday and the regrets of yesterday, and thinking about tomorrow and everything that may go wrong tomorrow. Just pick up two bags, real or imaginary. Put them in front of you. One of them has a four-letter word on it. Anyone? Have yeah. a guess? Fear. Fear? <coughs> Not a swear word. So. <laughs> 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 past. so what you do? Oh, so the other one would be future. future. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So what we're going to do is empty our fears, yesterday's regrets, or whatever happened yesterday, into that bag. Visually empty it. All of those worries of tomorrow, whatever's going to happen tomorrow, empty it, and throw them out the window, leave them out the door, whatever you want to do with them, because no matter what you do with them, they're going to be back with back you tomorrow. But for that night, be kind to yourself. So, next time you're asleep at night, or not asleep, or not asleep <laughs> at night, <laughs> just try and remember this, and maybe try that exercise too. Final stretch. Again, this is about changing our thinking. We've spoken a lot tonight about the importance of valuing it. And we all have choices. We all have work to do, and we all have money to make, and want to get further and progress. And sometimes that comes at a cost to sleep. And perhaps sometimes we forget that night is the time to rest and sleep. Proper rest is necessary for going further on the path. So, and I think that's true, not just for the Buddha's path and our cultivation, but economically, in our careers, just remembering that rest has a big role. But, there's always a but. Look, sometimes life gets in the way. Sometimes your children are sick. Yeah. Sometimes you need to get that PBEP documentary up. <laughs> Can't sleep. You need to get that project done. And it's sometimes even if we do everything, even if we do that discipline that we're taught, even if we try and do mindfulness, all day long, we won't get to sleep. And that's going to happen to all of us. And this is interesting. This quote is from a medical journal, not from a Buddhist book. The Buddhist tradition of accepting impermanence is key in recognising that attachment to desired outcomes causes suffering and distress. So it's what are we going to do on that night we haven't slept? Are we going to call it a, a ruined day and not function at all? Are we going to say, oh, 
angry, that's it. I'm sure I've done that before. Um, or there's other options. Can we call in for help, call our parents in, ask for an early day at work, possibly have a nap, and naps are, are great ways of getting refreshed. Exercise, get a bit of bright light. I think Buddhists apply this not only to sleep, but we try and apply this to everything that happens in our lives because so many things in, ha in life don't happen as we expect them to, even if we want them, want them to, and even if we've tried everything. So for Buddhists, this quote isn't just about sleep. Accept the good and the bad in life. It is only by not putting your happiness and sadness in gains or losses that one's ability and wisdom can be developed to overcome all difficulties. Mm. So summing it up, I love the iceberg analogy for Buddhism because it talks a little bit about what we can do on the surface and how we can go a bit deeper with our practice. So we've talked about how to get a better night's sleep, we could practice good sleep habits. We could be compassionate to ourselves. We could do a daily mindfulness exercise of 20 minutes. And we can adapt to the challenges that sleep throws at us by not getting angry, not getting upset, and accepting impermanence. At a deeper level, we want to make this just natural and easy. So let's practice good daily habits. Daily mindfulness in everything we do, or try. <laughs> and when we're faced with challenges of life, we start using skills of acceptance and accepting impermanence so that we can easily use them to adapt to sleep time. Where are we going? Okay. So at the end of the talk. So we just talked about a few things why a good quality sleep is important for a healthy body and mind. How poor sleep has mental, physical, social and economic consequences. And how we can use the Buddhist principles of disciplined meditation compassion and wisdom to both live and sleep according to the Dharma. Okay. So I think a lot of you are quite interested in sleep. There's a couple of really good resources um, on sleep science and, and graphs. So the Sleep Health Foundation has a lot of handouts. The Harvard site actually explains the sleep cycle and the, the um, circadian rhythm in quite detail. Uh, the number of Buddhist references and Ajahn Brahm's talk down the 